My name is Phil Bueller. I'm an artist uh, living and working out here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Uh, I've been photographing primarily abandoned spaces for almost 50 years, uh, trying to bring, rescue something that's meaningful uh, from these places that have been lost and forgotten and bring that into the present. Uh, and my work more recently has gotten much more political. Uh, I'm starting to create uh, walk-in photographs, big panoramic photographs, cycloramas of uh, important places that people wouldn't otherwise go to, like Ferguson or the Women's March on Washington or the border wall with Mexico or Flint, Michigan. Um, and, and I even went to a Trump rally in, in uh, Cincinnati. And so, you know, you're surrounded by a photograph. Uh, everything is kind of life-size. Um, and then uh, other installations, e even more political, more recently, in the last 12 months, I did uh, The Wall of Lies, which was a large 100-foot long, 10-foot tall mural uh, of all 20,000 of Trump's lies. Uh, it's fact-checked by the Washington Post. And that was installed in Bushwick here first, and then after it was defaced with some Proud Boys graffiti, we raised enough money to put it into, uh, on a wall and a big fence in Manhattan. And then in May, I did, I wrapped a church, a Baptist, Black Baptist church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, for the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. So that was uh, panoramic photos taken in 1921 by the Red Cross of the destruction. So I found uh, one of the churches that's in two of the photos that was destroyed was still active in Tulsa, and they had known that it was in this photo. So I kind of wrapped the four sides of this church with 40 foot tall, uh, 40 foot long, 10 foot tall photographs of the church kind of de demolished. I was photographing an abandoned psychiatric hospital in New Jersey and discovered that Woody Guthrie had once been a patient there. And then I went to the Woody Guthrie archives, met his daughter, Nora. She gave me his case number, which I then went back to this abandoned hospital and found his photographs in the basement in the dark room with these five by seven intake and discharge photos. So that was like an Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole I went down. I became the expert I'm like the expert of Woody Guthrie's life from 1956 to 1961, and, and a book came out of that. And, it, and uh, a lot of people gave me photographs to use that, of Woody at that time that had never had a context to put him in. You don't want to see this American icon hero dying. So uh, this, this was a, a way for Nora and a lot of the writings of Woody's from that era to come into a, and not just be, here's the sad end of an American folk hero. Back in the 70s, so when I was in high school, uh, it was when I first, I got a, you know, maybe I was like 13 when I got my first real camera, 14, I bought a Nikromat FTN with my paper route money uh, and started getting uh, photography and then film. And there was an organization called Young Filmmakers Film Club down on the Lower East Side of uh, New York, right near where the new museum is now. But back when it was the Bowery, you know, when it was just, and so, a friend and I would make 60 millimeter films because it was like an organization set up for poor kids on the Lower East Side, like in the Barrio. And they'd make like Kung Fu movies and Spanish. It was really, you know, with kids. Um, so we were making documentaries. We were from New Jersey. I, I grew up in the Bronx and then in New Jersey. And uh, so we, want, we made documentaries, Coney Island, and then we did one about Ellis Island. Um, which was, wasn't restored until like 10 years later. So it's just this island in New York Harbor that's abandoned. So we decided we were gonna make a movie out there because we hadn't, we did a little bit of, I'd never heard of it, you know. It turns out my grandparents came through Ellis Island and uh, so we rode this little rowboat out there. Um, knew that to stay away from Liberty Island because there's National Park Service there. And so we rode out several times, we would, um, we chain our rowboat to the a railroad tie, and we in between shoots, and then we take the you know walk, take path, the subway, and then a bus back to Jersey. And so we made this short ten-minute film on Ellis Island, which has been like has a long life now because it's the only footage 
a little bit before they fixed it up. So uh, they showed it at the Tribeca Film Festival. They showed it at the New York Film Festival. So it was kind of, it's funny to, these old things get resurrected. It, it, my, my work ages well. You know, abandoned places, they either get torn down or restored. And so that history gets lost, but if you still have it, it's, it's, uh, it's got renewed uh, interest. You know, I grew up in the 60s, so it's, you know, everybody wanted to be an astronaut like John Glenn. So this was part of my childhood, these massive machines. Uh, and same thing with the airplane graveyard. Grew up the Vietnam War, B-50, you know, all the weaponry. So as a kid, if a boy, you're kind of fascinated with tech. But then there's this dark side of tech. So, you know, the Vietnam War wasn't so great. And, they, and the same Titan missiles that they shot astronauts into space, they had in missile silos out in, in the desert to attack the Russians with. So I kind of, re a lot of my work is revisiting my childhood. It's like things that were, you know, you were taught or um, learned about, and then there's a different perspective years later. Uh, sometimes I know that ahead of time, and sometimes I don't. Like, um, when I f and sometimes it, it keeps evolving. Like Ellis Island, I said that the, a German theater group contacted me about looking for people whose parents came through Ellis Island from Bremerhaven in Germany, and it, my grandparents, that's where they came from. Um, so, I uh, photographed uh, the SS United States uh, down in Philly uh, in the, uh, 99, and then uh, my mother gave me pictures of my grandparents on the ship. So I was like, oh, I didn't know they went over. And it was like, and they went over in the, in the inaugural year of the ship, 1952, and on their way back to Germany. They were German, German immigrants, and this is, and I, I took a picture on the, the bow of my grandmother I re-photographed it. I put the camera in the exact same spot and uh, learned two things. One was whoever took the picture was really tall because I kept moving the tripod up to match the angle exactly. And then I realized it was my grandfather who I didn't really know well because he died when I was young. And so I'm like, he was taller than me. You know, he had at least be two inches taller than me. Um, and the other one was that my grandmother, I was like, oh, you're on the SS United States, fastest social liner ever going to Germany. How cool is that? And she's got a she's kind of a sad face. And I'm like, why isn't she like smiling? And it's because this is 1952, it's seven years after the end of World War II and she's going back to Germany to see her relatives and Germany is still destroyed. You know, it's, it's um, and it was so recent. So then that totally changed the context of the photograph as well as me photographing the ship. So I find connections to places I shoot even um, <coughs> even uh, Greystone Park Hospital, where I did the Woody Guthrie book, found out I had a first cousin that was a patient in the active part of the hospital. So, uh, so I try and bring that all uh, together, make it, I guess, the two things is, is, as art, it should in some way seduce somebody into the story. So it either has some, you know, it looks interesting, there's something compelling about it that makes you pause and then want to learn the rest of the story. I, fo I shoot very formally, like uh, with a tripod, and I lock the camera down, and there's, you'll see um, uh, a lot of, and, and that's kind of trying to organize the chaos of abandonment. So if, you know, there's peeled paint and things falling all over the place, but if I shoot in a very formal way, it adds this other tension to it. Uh, uh, you'll see a, a lot of my shots are that goes off to an infinity line, kind of like a Stanley Kubrick, like center point of focus. Uh, and some of that's conscious to, to, in this chaotic world, to make sense of it. Uh, I, my son started photographing abandoned places, uh, and I gave him a couple of rules. Here's the rules, because you're going to get caught and how not to get arrested when you get caught. Find a way in that you don't pass a no trespassing sign. Um, don't go through a do uh, window if you can, go through a door. Because if you go through a window and you pass a no trespassing sign, that's like 
no, that's a trespassing violation. But otherwise, you can just plead ignorance. What? I was just walking through the woods, went through this thing, walked in the door, it was open. Um, don't carry any, don't take anything. Don't have any tools with you. Have your camera out when they grab you. You know, um, plead stupid, uh, apologize, be incredibly respective to the police if it's the police. Um, I once was caught with a guy, a good friend of mine, Robert Wogan, who, um, we were in an abandoned, or, or a, what was a factory, Westinghouse, um, no, Alcoa Aluminum Plant in, in, uh, on the shore of Jersey, on the Hudson River, looking at Manhattan. And they were going to take this old plant, they used to make aluminum cans, they are going to turn it into condos. But then there was too many PCBs and poisonous things, so they basically roped it off and they were going to destroy it. We had to climb over like a 14-foot chain link fence to get in. And then we didn't realize there's all these proximity alarms all everywhere. It was totally wired up. And we were on a Sunday, so they kept, we kept tripping the alarms. We didn't realize it. And when we're leaving, we're climbing over the fence. We're on the fence, like way up high, and the police pull in below us. So we're still on the fence, and they're directly below us. They can't see us because their, their eye line is like... And then at the last minute, uh, you know, they're going to go back in the car, and a kind of cop glances up, and we're like on the fence, like kind of looking at them. And we've been quiet for like two minutes, and then we got caught. But um, they let us off. Because uh, I was also older than all the cops, you know, so they're kind of like, it's, I'm not a punk kid with spray cans, you know, or going to demolish something. So it's, there's one part adventure in it, and one part, you know, that, that building's gone. They just, you know, they demolished it. A lot of these places are, Greystone is demolished, that building's demolished. And then even when they restore it, like Ellis Island is not the same, because once they restore it, they've kind of, broom down the humanity. You know, it's, what's left is the building. And so they've polished the walls and repainted the walls and everything and all of the things that you, like, you know, a little mark in the floor where the door used to go is kind of been cleaned up. And so that, that use, the people kind of disappear. Ellis Island, the museum part, does an okay job of bringing them back. But there's, you know, the, I love that part of it. Just the, there's a trace of humanity still there from the, when they close the door. So this is an example of a project. Uh, it was called The Wall of Lies that I did actually with Tom Tenney at Radio Free Brooklyn. Uh, and he wanted to, on the radio station, just read all of Trump's lies for like a week live. And COVID happened, so he couldn't do that. The, the studio closed down uh, uh, in the interim. So a few months later, I thought it would be a great visual project. So uh, work with Glenn Kessler at the, the Washington Post actually c collects these. So they have like the lie, when it was, was it in a speech or a tweet? Why is it a lie? The, how many Pinocchios does it get? What is the category of it? How many times has he repeated it? Um, and my day job, I do a lot of statistics. I work in like Excel a lot and SPSS. I do market research and analysis. So this in Excel file gets me excited because my, my day job is um, finding pattern recognition and then translating it into charts and graphs that actually make sense and make it understandable. So I thought that this would be a great way to visualize this is um, there's a couple of images back here. So it turns it into a 100-foot long, 10-foot tall mural. And you can see here they're kind of color-coded. So if you look down the thing, you can, oh, it was about the border wall. Then it's about um, uh, green was COVID. Um, and the part that we were going to do bef uh, until the January 6th insurrection, we, I had the last three months of his lies was going to be another 50 feet to the 100. And that was all the election, all the lies about the election. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a departure from my work, but in some ways not. Uh, my work slowly has been adding elements. Um, there'll be photographs of a place, but then I add other things. Like I did a, a show of an abandoned shopping mall. And then inside the, in the show was, since the mall was uh, built in 1973, which is actually when I got my driver's license and started driving around to malls, and it was near where I grew up, I put a record bin 
in the gallery that had a hundred of the best albums from 1973 and then an old record player that people could play them. So, um, so that was, or when I did the show about the Cold War ruins, I had, you know, had a little red phone that you could pick up and hear. It would be John F. Kennedy's speech about the Cuban Missile Crisis, very measured and reassuring, and then Trump's, you know, fire and fury, we're going to blow North Korea up speech, and they were juxtaposed. Um, and I had a Geiger counter that was over a Fiesta Ware plate that are, the red ones are radioactive. So it was, you, you were in the gallery and you just heard click, 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 and looking at these pictures. So, and then what am I trying to say? So I'm trying to take something from the past, something that I connect to, and then bring it into the present and share it with people who don't have that experience, don't have that perspective. Mm -hmm.